Well, as this fine young man just said, I am Tamiko Fraser Hines, and I am an actress, a model, a mother, a wife, a motivational speaker, a life coach, and a goddess. Let's get the goddess part in there. <laughs> um, this session, as he said, is a practical guide to egg donation. We'd like to thank Pacific Fertility Center of Los Angeles for supporting this conversation on egg donation. And we want to thank all of you for joining us today and invite you to continue this conversation by following us on Facebook or Twitter and use the hashtag FPLA14 because we'd love to hear from you. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story and why I am giddy to be here as the moderator. Um, as you, some of you heard at the tail end of Dr. Sahakian's last session, I am the mother of two amazingly beautiful twin boys that were conceived using an anonymous egg donor. My husband and I chose to speak passionately about this because, especially in our community, it is not spoken of. So I am... After I was diagnosed with premature ovarian failure, which makes, basically means that I was dealing with early menopause at the age of 39, we tried everything under the sun for five years to get me pregnant on my own. And then we powerfully chose, and I use that term powerfully chose because we weren't resigned to using an egg donor. We weren't like, oh, well, this is our last option. We powerfully chose to go ahead and Within three months of making that choice, I was pregnant with twins. So I just wanted to share that and let you know why I'm here. And my boy, our boys' names are Bryce and Caden, and they are 14 months old. And can you tell how much I love them? Can you? T I mean, I'm just like the happiest mother ever. Um, Did you just say that? Because you look great. Oh, thank you. And I'm going to be 46 <laughs> next month. Did I say that? If you can do the math. But thank you. No, I carried. I carried full term. Well, 36 weeks. But anyway, that's another story. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Sahakian. He is the medical director at Pacific Fertility Center of Los Angeles. And if you go to the website, fertilityplanet.com, you can get more information on all of the speakers today, and you can book appointments with them. So I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Sahakian so he can introduce himself. Thank and, you. Uh, you Thank go. you. So I am... Uh, the medical director of Pacific Fertility Center. We are four doctors. Um, my partner is actually sitting right here, Dr. De Ugarte. Um, and we've been doing this for a while. This topic is about egg donation. And I presume anyone here is either going through this process or thinking about egg donation. So hopefully this will be beneficial in understanding the, the intricacies of the uh, the medical aspect of egg donation. I'm not going to talk about uh, the emotional aspect, which I think you probably could do at the end and answer those questions. Um, obviously, I haven't gone through the process myself. I've treated many patients with egg donation, and I know how hard it is to actually make that decision to cross that bridge and say, you know what, I'm giving up on my genetics. I've done enough. I have no regrets. And then just embark this new journey, uh, which is in many cases very hopeful. The, most women today who have a uterus, a normal uterus, will be able to have a child if they say, you know what, there are no hurdles we'll go through the egg donation process if we cannot get pregnant with our own eggs. So actually I'm going to go down sure. this way. It'll be easier. Uh, this, yeah, sounds like, okay. I put this on, is it working? I'm not going to sing, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Um, okay, so a lot of this is going to be medical, and it's going to be kind of a, my thought process as I think about egg donation. So at the end, obviously, you can ask questions, but some of it is going to be technical, technical, but I think it will give you a better idea of the whole um, uh, concept. So quickly, I, I don't have a pointer, but I just wanted to review female anatomy for anybody here who uh, doesn't know their own anatomy. So uh, you are born with two ovaries, and uh, the uterus is where obviously uh, the pregnancies occur, but the uh, ovaries are critical in providing the gamete or the genetics to have a baby. You need an egg, you need a sperm to have a baby. Every woman is born with a set number of eggs. This differentiates you from men. Many other things differentiate you from men, but one of them is that you actually are born with a set number of eggs. Unlike us, we make sperm every three months or so, or 70 days, you have your complement of eggs that you're going to use throughout your lifetime. 
Uh, typically, it's about a million at birth, and by the time you reach puberty, women are basically have lost half of their eggs, and they're now at around half a million. So between puberty and menopause, which is about 400 menstrual cycles, you use 400 eggs, and yet you have half a million of them to, uh, to give you those 400 eggs. It's a very wasteful process. And actually, women don't understand this, that when a man ejaculates, millions of sperm are wasted. Well, kind of the same thing happens in women. Every month that you ovulate, a bunch of eggs start a race, and one is ovulated, is released, the others die. It, it is obviously at a much lesser extent than men, but it's a very wasteful process. So this is an important slide for every woman to understand. The ovaries contain the eggs. They are in little follicles, little fluid-like spaces called follicles. And the egg is dormant there in these primary follicles until the time they are recruited to be ovulated. So at the beginning of each month, bunch of these little eggs, little follicles, and no one knows really how this happens and who decides how many, etc. But from a signal coming from the brain, from the pituitary gland, a couple of hormones do the job, you are basically recruiting a set number of eggs, and it varies from woman to woman from uh, as far as with age, it changes. But these eggs, bunch of these little follicles, this shows the journey of one follicle going from a primary follicle, growing, growing, and this is the little egg, and then at one point, which is usually two weeks after you started your period, you're gonna release the egg, that's ovulation. The follicle then disintegrates and becomes something called the corpus luteum. Well, imagine this, every month, dozens and dozens of these eggs start this race. Only one becomes mature and is released, the other die. So you're using these eggs until you run out. And once you run out, that's menopause. Unfortunately, before you run out of eggs, you actually run out of good eggs first. It's almost like eggs sitting on the table and they get rotten with time. Now it takes longer than three days for a chicken's egg to get rotten, but it's the same concept. They deteriorate with time. So not only your numbers go down as you get older, but the quality of those eggs that are sitting there since before birth is deteriorating. All right, so let's see here. Every month, the brain in the beginning of each cycle, menstrual cycle, just before your period actually starts, secretes a hormone called follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. The reason I'm being technical, because all of you here probably know what this is, because you've probably been tested for it, and you gotta kind of understand what happens. Well, this hormone basically stimulates these primary follicles, these baby follicles, to grow. And the less of these follicles you have, or the more, or the older they are, the more FSH you need to kickstart them. It's like you're driving a car, and your car is getting older, you have to push that pedal further to keep up with the same speed. Two other hormones are important to understand. One of them is called the LH, which triggers the release of the egg. It happens at mid-cycle. And if any one of you here has done IVF, you know that you take a shot called HCG to trigger ovulation. Well, HCG does the job of LH. And then finally, an est estrogen, which is produced by, by the eggs. And actually, we can test the level in your blood to know if there's an egg growing and how mature it's getting. After you ovulate, Finally, there's another hormone secreted progesterone that basically sustains a pregnancy in case you do get pregnant. All right. The most important test that you can do to check ovarian reserve are these three tests. FSH and estradiol on day two or three of your menstrual flow, a hormone called antimullerian hormone, and an ultrasound to measure the enteral follicle count. I'm gonna go one by one on these, and you might say, why are you talking about these? Well, because some of you might not be convinced it's time to do egg donation, mm -hmm. and you have to have had these tests done to be convinced. All right, so the FSH, as I said, follicle stimulating hormone, is the hormone that stimulates the ovaries to produce the eggs. And as your ovaries age, as you age, your ovaries, your eggs become resistant, you make less eggs, and your pituitary gland, your body has to produce more FSH. And this slide shows you how pregnancy rates actually decline 
as the FSH level increases. And you can see if you're in the like 16 to 20 range, your odds of getting pregnant is very small. I mean, almost regardless of age, you still your odds are low. What's also important about this slide is this is not carved in stone. We have patients with FSHs of 22 who had a baby. You can see here, even if you have an FSH of 20, but you're 35, still 4 to 5% of patients have gotten pregnant. So it's not crazy for you to try IVF using your own eggs before you say, well, I tried and it's not working. Okay. Another test, now the FSH has to be measured on a certain day of your menstrual cycle, on the second or third day. If you do it on day one, it's too early, on day four, it's too late. It's very important that you time it right. Um, we see patients that basically come in and they do FSHs every month. I, I disagree with that. Once you catch a high FSH, your FSH is high. I mean, I don't believe that waiting till it's lower, it's gonna make a big difference. You have a problem and just, Treat it. You know that's uh, the way I look at it. Uh, the AMH test is, is uh, this is a hormone again secreted by growing follicles, um, can be measured at any time of the cycle. And the beauty of this test is that you know you can go into your doctor tomorrow and say, listen, do an ultrasound and do an AMH level. I want to know my fertility potential, and it's pretty accurate. Uh, interestingly enough, it declines with age, and it has a direct correlation with the number of eggs you will produce during an IVF cycle. There are, I, I do FSH and estradiols on everybody, but the best test, which is next, is enter follicle count, where you actually see the follicles and count them. This is the next best test. And those tests together really will give you a clear idea where you stand as far as your ovarian reserve. So when you measure this test, and you can see here how the levels decline, you basically want levels that are higher than one or two. And the more eggs you have, the higher your AMH. If you have, your AMH is very low, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, then you know that you don't have a lot of eggs, you don't have time, the odds are you might not be able to get pregnant using your own eggs. Having said this, we still see some patients with low AMHs have babies. My partner just had a patient that, that if you had asked me beforehand, I would have said the odds are probably zero, and she just told me she, she got pregnant. So it can happen. That that's why these are not carved in stone. Now, the final test you can do, again, three tests. FSH, estradiol is a blood test done on the second or third day. Typically, we ask you to do the AMH test along with it, and then have an ultrasound in the early parts of your uh, menstrual uh, cycle, usually within the first week of your period. This is a simple ultrasound. It takes five minutes. And what we do is we go in, and these little follicles, the growing follicles, we count them on both sides. Nothing simpler than this. And uh, we add up both ovaries, and that number has a great, great value in predicting your odds of getting pregnant with IVF. And typically, we, we would like to have numbers more than seven or eight. If you have 20, you're in great shape. If you have one or two, you're in bad shape, okay? It doesn't tell me necessarily the quality of the eggs in these follicles, but it certainly, certainly tells me how many eggs I can obtain from you if you did IVF. And then the less eggs you produce, the lower the odds. I, I want to stress, though, a 36-year-old woman producing two eggs has a better chance than a 44-year-old producing two eggs. So even though you're producing the same number of eggs, that age difference will make a big difference in success rates. All right, so let's go back to this one. And... Uh, these are the most common causes or ca candidates for egg donation. Tomiko is obviously the premature ovarian failure, whereby for genetic reasons or sometimes because of cancer and chemotherapy, uh, your ovaries die. You're done. You're in menopause, and it can happen at 25, 35. A lot of these women, I don't know if it's the case with you, the mother also had an early menopause, but sometimes it just hits you. You don't know. You're 32. Next thing you know, your periods are spares, you're getting them every three, four months, you go test and you'll realize that actually you are suffering from premature ovarian failure. Um, advanced maternal age is the most common cause, that's the bread and butter of egg donation. You see the women who are in their 40s who either have failed previous IVF cycles or uh, have been tested just to see if you can, they can get pregnant and they've realized that actually their ovaries have failed. Um, 
there are now we're seeing more and more patients who have uh, genetic diseases that actually need to resort to an egg donor to actually eliminate the disease. So that's another category of patients. Small, but certainly we see those patients. All right. So what are the keys to successful outcome with egg donation? It's very, very simple, besides having a good doctor. <laughs> no. uh, you have to have a good uterus. You can have the best egg donor, a 22-year-old gorgeous woman with wonderful ovaries, but if your uterus is not normal, you're not going to have a baby. You obviously need young eggs. How young? It's, it's relative. The younger, the better. We typically like donors who are under 30. A 22-year-old will give you a higher success rate than a 28-year-old. It's not a huge difference, but certainly a 22 is better than you know 38. We don't recommend that you find an a donor who's older than 34, 35, unless it's a relative. I mean, I've had patients who brought their sister who's 38 or even 41 and had a baby because they had no chance. So even though the odds will go down, you still uh, can use any woman or a relative or a friend who has decent ovaries to, uh, to become a candidate for you uh, as an egg donor. Uh, you also need decent sperm. And I say decent for a reason. You don't need much, you know? It, it's the truth. We, with the techniques we use these days to fertilize an egg, you just need the handful of sperm because that's how many eggs you're gonna get. The best donor is gonna give you 30, 40 eggs at most, you know? Uh, usually average is 15 to 20, so you need that many sperm. You don't need a lot of sperm uh, to conceive. Um, so quickly, back to the uterus. Why is it important to have a normal uterus? Because that's where implantation happens. That's your soil. You cannot have rocks in the soil, which are polyps or fibroids. You can't. It, uh, the embryo will not implant. Uh, the embryo is like a seedling, and it has to throw roots. And if you have rocks in the soil, uh, it's going to prevent it from growing. You also want a thick soil. So you want a thick lining. And there are conditions or procedures that you might undergo that can destroy your lining. Some of them is like DNCs or curatages, uh, infections, uh, you know, manipulation of the lining, surgeries inside the uterus to remove a fibroid or a polyp can damage the lining. So the first thing you do, obviously, is check your ovarian reserve. Go to your doctor and say, you can tell them what tests you want. Tell them I want to do an FSH, estradiol, AMH, and antral follicle count, simple. And if you determine that the odds are very, very low, or you have failed already, you know that you need an egg donor. Next thing you do is, okay, tell me if I can carry. So you do simple tests, an ultrasound. Uh, sometimes we do a fluid ultrasound where we inject, inject water inside the cavity to see these polyps and then have an answer. In some cases, if you have a history that suggests damaged uterus, you might need to do what we call a mock cycle, which is a dress rehearsal. Take the estrogen hormones like you would have if you had an egg donor right now and see if you build a good lining. It's very, very easy to test. We actually, on ultrasound, can measure the thickness of the lining and we can see this three-layer pattern, which we call a trilaminar pattern. And these two variables, when you look at the uterus, have also a very good correlation with pregnancy rates. I'm not going to go into more detail about how thick, uh, how good is, how thick it, etc. But typically, we would like linings of eight to nine millimeters. All right, what are the, step you the steps you take if you are a candidate to egg donation? Obviously, make sure you confirm that you need an egg donor. Make sure that emotionally, physically, financially, you're ready to take that step. Then confirm that you have a healthy uterus, and then do some preliminary testing to make sure you can carry a baby. Nothing to do with infertility, rather make sure you don't have diabetes, you don't have hypertension, you don't want to really get pregnant and end up then dealing with medical complications of pregnancy. So we are very careful to do a battery of tests to make sure that you are a candidate to get pregnant, whether with an egg donor or not, doesn't matter. Um, then you have to find an egg donor, you got to screen the donor, and you have to do IVF. Okay, so let's jump to finding an egg donor. Um, where do you look? typically online databases. So you have two options when you're looking for an egg donor. She did an anonymous egg donor, which means she went somewhere to an agency, looked online and liked the woman, you know, reviewed the profile, et cetera, and said, okay, I want this woman. You can do an open versus closed donation with an agency. So you can say, okay, I like this donor, but I like to meet the donor. And a lot of donors these days actually want to meet the recipients. So 
Uh, I recommend it, but uh, a lot of women don't want that. Uh, husbands don't want that, actually. So uh, it's you have an option when you're looking for a donor on a, an online database, uh, and if you want to meet the donor, ask the agency to ask the donor, and the donor, and then you'll see if that happens. You can also find the donor yourself. You really don't need an agency. You can uh, resort to a family member, a friend, as long as they're young. I had a patient actually who went to a hustler in Santa Monica and saw a waitress who was working there and called her, talked to her, and she used her eggs, and she was actually working to make money to go to college, and she had a baby with that woman. So you don't need to go to an agency. You can find a donor yourself. The steps to take you know, are obviously easier through an agency because they screen the donor, et cetera, but you don't have to. Um, how do you choose a donor? That you know, can be tough. Age is certainly, medically speaking, is a very important criterion because success rates is correlated to age. You want a young donor. You're going to review the medical and genetic and family history, the profile of the donor online. Theoretically, they can lie. No one checks on those. There's, it's impossible to check if they're lying or not. You hope that they're not. And most donors think that we're going to do some tests later and we can catch them. So I think they don't lie. But um, you know, they could. Uh, physical characteristics, it's obviously some important aspect. Uh, most women would like the baby to somewhat look like them. Some people don't care, but most do. So you want to pick features similar to you. Height and weight is definitely genetic, so that's important if it's important to you. Uh, the toughest one, the reason I put at the bottom is intellectual abilities. We don't, donors don't do IQs. Um, so you really can't tell often if they're smart. If I'm telling you pick a 22-year-old donor, well, she might not have done much already. So you don't know how smart they are. So then what you need to do is, in my opinion, meet the donor. Because then in 20 minutes, you can tell who they are. Um, it's, you can look at GPAs and SAT score, but they can lie. So there are limitations when you pick a donor. You got to trust that they're not, but you have to also be cognizant of the fact that they might. Um, the donor screening is, uh, as I said, first they fill a profile, they answer a lot of questions about their family, etc., and then they come in to see the doctor and they undergo physical examination, and then we do tests to check the ovarian reserves, reserve like the recipient did in the past, what made them use an egg donor. So similar testing. Um, most women who are young, they don't need any blood tests. We just do an ultrasound and the enteral follicle count. If we see 25 eggs, then that's good enough. They're good donors. Um, we do some general tests required by kind of law or uh, by our society. And then, of course, the government came up in 2005 and said you need to do these tests as well within 30 days of taking the eggs out. I'm not going through details, but you might hear about this additional FDA testing that you'll have to pay more. Very stupid, but it's, it, we have to do it. Um, the genetic screening of a donor is, um, it can vary depending on the, her background, depending on, uh, you know, every donor has to have a genetic risk assessment. Uh, we use the geneticist, they talk to the geneticist, they built a family tree, and then they come up with recommendation of what tests to do. Uh, there are some basic tests that the American Society for Reproductive Medicine requires us to do on everybody, regardless of their background. But uh, geneticists might add additional tests in case there is suspicion of certain diseases. Um, the treatment. Okay, I'm going through a lot pretty quickly, but I want to answer questions at the end. Uh, the treatment is very, very simple. And if you've done IVF, you already know half of it. You know the, you know the top part. And you say, why are these women on birth control pills? Well, that's the, how we can synchronize your cycle. So if we put the woman on birth control pills, we can stop it and induce a period. So if we put two women on, the, on it and for very, a variable amount of times, we can stop both of them at the same time and have them have a period at the same time. And then basically the donor is taking fertility hormones to stimulate the production of eggs while the recipient is taking estrogen to prepare the uterus to accept the embryos. And typically this whole part from this point to here takes about three weeks, whereby after about 10 to 12 days of fertility hormone, we do a procedure called egg retrieval, and typically five days later we do a procedure called embryo transfer. The only two hormones that the recipient will take is estrogen and progesterone in addition to prenatal vitamin. All right, so... Ovarian stimulation, um, 
again, some of you have done IVF, which basically led you to do egg donation. And you can see here, this is an ovary without any fertility hormones in the beginning of the cycle, and this is basically 12 days, 11 days later after taking fertility hormones. Uh, this is a lucky woman, lucky donor, because on one side she already has 10 or 11 follicles. This is what happens when a woman takes fertility hormones. The hormones you take are basically the same hormones your brain produces, FSH and LH, in larger quantities. So what we're trying to do is trying to salvage or rescue some of those eggs that started that journey in the beginning of the cycle. So the number of eggs a donor produces depends on her ovarian reserve. And the ovarian reserve depends on genetics and age. So the younger donor will have a higher cohort of eggs when she starts her period. And if you give that woman fertility hormones, she will have a higher number of eggs recruited to grow to maturity. And that's what determines how good the donor is. It's like a horse race, and then you have these stalls, and a young donor, it's like you have 20 horses in the stalls, and the fertility hormone is somebody opening those doors. And if you give her a lot, you can open all those doors, and 20 horses will leave. And if you give half of that, then maybe half of the stalls open. So that's the concept of egg donation. You're basically rescuing or salvaging eggs that otherwise that woman would have lost that month. And that's a very important concept for, don concept for donors because that tells you that they're not going to run out of eggs. It's not going to affect you, their future ability to have kids or go through menopause. They're basically using eggs that otherwise they would have lost. And that's how we counsel donors when they do this. And they can do it multiple times without any few, you know, effect on their fertility. So the procedure of egg retrieval, again, many of you have had quickly. It's using a vaginal probe. It's done through the vagina. It takes about 10 minutes. With a needle, we go into the follicles and aspirate the eggs. The eggs obviously go into the laboratory. I'll go that quickly. But these are the important facts that uh, donors need to know about fertility hormones. That is, we're rescuing eggs. We're not using up the eggs. Uh, it does not affect their ovarian reserve or their future ability to have kids. It does not push them to go menopause, and there are really no strong proven associations of cancers with these drugs, the injectable hormones. So once you get the eggs out, we will clean them, we put them in a little Petri dish, and then we fertilize them. There are two ways of fertilizing an egg. The most uh, conventional way is you put the eggs in these little bubbles, and then you take sperm, concentrate some sperm, 30, 40,000 of them, you put them around the egg and you let them incubate overnight. That's called conventional fertilization. And if there are male factors or the sperm is not great, then we do a procedure called ICSI. It stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is basically taking a sperm and injecting it directly into the egg. Both methods are very, very good, giving you 70 to 80% fertilization. And when an egg fertilizes, it becomes an embryo. And over the next four or five days, it divides into multiple cells. And typically on day five is when we do the transfer and we will put one or two embryos. We no longer put more than two embryos unless the embryos don't look good. But typically it's recommended the standard of care today is to transfer two embryos to eliminate the risk of high order multiples. It appears that pregnancy rates are the same whether you put two or three embryos, as long as the embryos are of great quality. The embryo transfer is a simple five-minute procedure where a catheter is filled with the embryos and introduced into the uterus through the cervix. There's no pain involved. I don't feel anything. You don't feel much. And then you basically lie there for an hour, and then you go home. We ask you to rest for about a day or so, and then 10 days later, you do the pregnancy test. Okay. How common is egg donation. This graph shows you the number, percentage of cycles where an egg donor was, was used and the variable is the age of the woman. And as you can see that when you get to 44, I mean 60 to 70 percent of all IVF cycles are using an egg donor. So if you're in this age group, it's pretty much 100 percent. You cannot get pregnant with your own eggs for all practical purposes over the age of 44. Uh, we've had Obviously, pregnancies at 44 and one at 45, but in 23 years, I've never gotten anybody pregnant over the age of 44 with their own eggs. Uh, my friend got pregnant at 45 with her own eggs on her own through sex, but I haven't been able to get anybody pregnant. It appears that it's very, very difficult. So you can be, I mean, if you're 48, 49, you pretty much know that you need an egg, use an egg donor. There's no uh, age cutoff for egg donation legally. There's no law. 
we go to 55. Um, I've had pregnancies in women older than 55. I hold the record for the 67-year-old with twins. I have a couple of 62-year-olds, 57, 58. But since then, we've changed our protocols, our policies now is we will stop at 55. But what this tells you is that we actually can get a, pregnant, a woman pregnant and this woman was in menopause for 18 years. So we can rejuvenate the uterus, and as long as you have a healthy uterus that we can build a lining, your odds of having a baby is very, very high. And talking about numbers, um, basically this shows you the percentage of treatment cycles and pregnancy rates, and pretty much these days, 80% chance you're gonna get pregnant. If you have a normal uterus, you use a decent donor and with decent sperm. So very, very high chance of pregnancy versus one in 244, one in 5,000 at 45 with IVF. Um, this also shows what happens with live births per transfer. If you're using donor eggs, you can see the pregnancy rates are very high. If you're using your own eggs, as you get older, your chances pretty much gets to zero at 45. Um, these are our last year success rate with egg, dona egg donation. 79% uh, of our patients have gotten pregnant with two embryos, uh, 67 with one embryo, and our frozen success rate varies if depending on how many embryos we transfer. I think there's maybe one more slide or no, that's it. So hopefully I, uh, I speak fast, but uh, I gave you kind of a nice summary of the whole process and I'll sit there and then you can answer questions. I can answer questions. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions, the floor is open now. Yes, ma'am. After a simulated crisis, whether it was through IUI or IVF, and you go in to try it again, um, is it normal if you're, if, like, they check that you also have to have a follow of it? Is it, a, is it normal or is it a problem if there were, like, only one or two? Well, that's a clear hint that your ovaries are at the... Uh, at the matter that it affects it, that you got tumors and they got them before? No. You mean if you had a cycle and then it failed and you went right away? Yeah. We typ typically want a month break, not because you'll get more or less eggs. It's because if you had a procedure to get the eggs out, you want the ovaries to heal. But no, that no, will not... not, but not I mean, you didn't do an egg retrieval? No. No, it won't. Hmm. Every month your ovaries have a set number of eggs that are going to grow. Now, if you don't give drugs, you're going to produce one egg, most likely. With drugs, you're going to produce more eggs only and only if you have more than one egg growing that month. Do you understand? Yeah. The, the, what, what, you could take a bucket of fertility hormones. It will make no difference if two eggs are growing. And that's why, actually, if you're not responding well and you're producing two eggs, the next month, don't bother taking all those drugs. So it's not going to make a difference. Well, that's, yeah. And Two eggs as opposed to one egg. No, no, correct. Yes. So when you go through puberty and failure, is there anything different that happens in between each pregnancy? It's a very good question, actually. The lowest pregnancy rates uh, with egg donation is in women with premature ovarian failure. And the reason is, you probably, I don't know if you knew that, but because women who have premature ovarian failure, there's a reason why they did fail. And that's because autoantibodies or antibodies in their system actually destroy those eggs. So they have a disease that causes the premature ovarian failure rather than you're 45, okay, biologically you're too old now. So pregnancy rates, I, I didn't show that slide, uh, that slide, are lowest with egg donation in women 25 to 32. And because the reason why you had the premature ovarian failure could also cause implantation failure. Even though you're using donor eggs, so you're fixing the egg issue, but you're still not fixing 100% the implantation issue because those antibodies in your system that actually kill the eggs can actually attack and kill an embryo. Nothing, you take your shot at it. You still have good odds, but instead of 80%, you're more like 50, 55%. Here's an example. I'm glad I there. didn't know that yeah. because it would have freaked my head out. Yeah, it is, it is freaky, but that, that's... that's an, an, No, no, because whether you have premature ovarian failure or you're 
28, but you don't make eggs, but you're still ovulating, we're still going to supplement your body with the estrogen progesterone you need. The only difference is if you have premature ovarian failure, we ask you to be really careful and check your thyroid and diabetes because those are diseases that go hand in hand uh, with premature ovarian failure. Do you have any of those? No. Any other questions? Well, okay, here we go. I mean, you can, actually. And uh, there is uh, basically three, two ways of doing this. One is using an egg donor to get eggs fresh or buying frozen eggs. A few years ago, I would say the odds would have been much lower with frozen eggs because the technology was not there to freeze those eggs and get good survival and fertilization. Today, it's actually much, 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 much better. So I think it's right around the corner where success rates are probably going to be the same using frozen eggs versus fresh eggs. The advantage of fresh eggs is that you have more of a choice of picking an egg donor. You can meet the egg donor and you'll have leftovers so you can probably do more than one cycle. So if you have a sibling, the odds are you're not gonna find those eggs again for the second baby. But if you use a fresh cycle, you probably have frozen embryos that you can come back and have a second baby with the same genetic link. Yes. Egg donor, we will cancel a cycle, at least I will, I think, I don't know if Catherine, you do the same, but I will say, say, uh, cancel a cycle with less than six eggs. So if this, somebody comes in and uh, a don brings a donor and we do the cycle, this is a donor through an agency, so you have to pay the donor to give you eggs, and I see five follicles, I will cancel the cycle until you get another donor, because you're not really getting what you're paying for. I totally know what the cost is. <laughs> yeah, there's two parts to the cost when you're doing egg donation. This is what you pay me to do this and what you pay the agency to get an egg donor. The agency fees, $6,000. Donors, eight to 10,000. That's your about 14. Donor screening, about 1,500, 2,000. Donor medication, about 3,000. Mm -hmm. And then, you know exactly what you paid. <laughs> and then you have legal fees, $20,000. You haven't even paid the doctor a penny. So overall, the average cost of one cycle fake donation could easily be in the range of $35,000. Now, we do have special programs. We have payment plans. We have discounted plans for uh, individuals with financial hardship. So, but still, the minimum you will have to pay a doctor to do it, seven to $8,000. So seven to $8,000. Plus the 20 you have to... Unless you get your own donor. If you bring a friend, you're not paying anything, you're not paying an agency, you're still going to pay about six, 7,000 in screening and medications, but you could do the whole thing under 15, 16,000. It's a lot of money. Yep, it is. <laughs> Correct, and 20% chance might not work and you lose the money. So I always bring that up too. I'll speak to that very briefly. I'm not sure what the time is, so somebody give me a heads up. Okay. Um, we tried for five or six years. We could have had 10 children for the money we spent trying when we, when we went to do egg donation. Um, I used to be a very highly paid model many years ago and not so much anymore. So we had to go into our retirement to, to do this. And happily so. I said to my husband, I would hate, I, I believe in the manifestation of money, so it's coming back. So I would hate to have not been able to have my children for fear of not having this $25,000 at my retirement time. So it is it is pricey and it, it is unfortunately not covered by most insurances, but I just- No insurance to cover it. Yeah, okay, no, no. yeah. Oh, interesting, very interesting. So yes, it, it, it is pricey and you just have to weigh, you know, what, what you're, what, what, what you are able to do. But the baby is priceless, like a MasterCard moment, yes, you know? Yes, yes, I got two. <laughs> um, any okay so I'm just gonna we have to wrap it up I just wanted to uh, ask one final question and make a quick comment doctor do you recommend telling the child or children that they were uh, egg donor babies personally me yes if you are over 45 
yes, because they will know you did. And if you're under 45, no. And I'll just, I'll just say that my husband and I chose to very publicly share our story. Number one, because as I said in the previous session, in the African American community, infertility, fertility, whatever you want to call it, is unspoken, unspoken of, and there's a shame and a stigma. And I don't want my children to, to grow up feeling ashamed of how they got here. All I want them to know is that undying amounts of love brought them here. So I've even written a children's story. It's not published yet, but about Prince, Prince, Princess Tomiko and Prince Chris and how uh, evil queen Infertilia <laughs> took her. And, and, then they, and then our love was so strong that she gave me these two golden eggs. Don't take my story. I'm going to publish it. Um, <laughs> So I, so we will definitely, and, and for those of you that are considering it, my biggest, biggest through my whole pregnancy concern that I, was that I wasn't gonna bond with these children because they weren't genetically my own. I'm a model, I was like, oh my God, they're not gonna look like me. That goes out the window the second they arrive, even before, but for me, the second that they arrive and you hold them, I, I could not be more bonded with these boys if they were genetically my own. So if you have that concern, please, because I was a basket case, really crying every day that I wasn't going to bond with these children. You not, care less. yeah, it's the it's, so don't worry about that. I have two thousand babies from egg donation. Not one patient has said yeah. that. Yeah, so Maybe don't, because that was a big concern for me. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. I just want to say a couple things to wrap us up. First of all, thank you all for joining us. And don't forget that you can contact and learn more about this whole conference at fertilityplanet.com. There's going to be videos and all the sessions. And um, I'd like to thank Fora.tv Fora for recording the programs. Thank you to Dr. Sahakian for his expertise today. I learned a lot. It was like memory lane <laughs> going down there. And thank you to the sponsor of this session, Pacific Fertility Center of Los Angeles, for supporting this conversation. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for coming.